I just wanted to welcome you all to, for coming, and we're probably going to start the program in a minute, so if you haven't had the opportunity to have breakfast, please enjoy. I'm Lisa Egan from the Chamber of Commerce of Reading North Reading. Hi, good morning. Hey, y'all. Um, thanks so much for coming to our ARCASA and CIT of North Reading Substance Abuse discussion. September is uh, National Recovery Month, so it's perfect timing, and we were delighted to bring these resources, important data, and support to the communities of Reading, North Reading, and beyond. And thank you for RCTV for coming to film, so people who weren't able to join us today can share and learn. And I'd also like to give a shout out to Neo, who owns Fusion Cafe, and uh, his team for hosting us and being willing to close down for an hour and a half for us to offer this event in this kind of a space with a hot breakfast, um, it's really nice and it's a great downtown resource. So think of it every time or any time you want like catering or lunch, um, be sure to support our local chamber members. I appreciate it. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to Erica McNamara. She's the director of the Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse, which we shortened to ARCASA. And she's been here since 2008. She's been overseeing a wide range of substance abuse and mental health promotion projects and has garnered grants totaling $1.8 million for funding for ARCASA, which is very impressive. And she has um, lots of great resources to share and um, great experience. And I'd also like to introduce Julianne DeAngelis, who is the outreach coordinator for ARCASA. So give us a wave so we know. Yeah. So they've got great information in the back and all sorts of um, materials for you to share and bring back to your workplace. So without further ado, I'd love to turn it over to Erica. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lisa. Um, thank you so much for coming. It's really an honor to be here and to have you all come about this issue. It's very hard to get people talking about the issue of substance abuse. It can be an uncomfortable issue uh, for many people because it's not something that you know comes up in an everyday conversation unless you've been impacted personally or professionally. So thank you so much for being here and being willing to kind of spend your breakfast time with us. We really appreciate it. I just want to say um, a few things about some of the resources that we have in the room today. Um, we have some of our partners from the Winchester Coalition here. Um, they do a lot of the same work that we do, but in Winchester. We're part of a regional collaborative called the Mystic Valley Public Health Coalition, and that involves Medford, Malden, Melrose, Wakefield, Winchester, Stoneham. Did I get it all? Lauren? And Lauren is our director. Um, she's based in Medford. So a lot of the resources I'm going to share today are from both the Mystic Valley Public Coalition as well as the Reading Coalition. Um, we also have partners in North Reading, and some of their resources are here. They couldn't be here today, but they wanted to share their resources. So we really are doing uh, a lot of work together. Um, my office is based at the Reading Police Department, so the work that we do couldn't um, happen without the support of the town and our, our police department. Our Deputy Chief Clark is here. Thanks for coming, Deputy Chief. And also um, um, my supervisor, Lieutenant Abadi, and um, my right-hand partner, um, Brian Lewis, our new school resource officer. So thank you to, to my uh, everyday colleagues who really support the work that we do day in and day out. So I just want to start with um, a little bit about why our community is focusing on this issue, why we created a coalition, what some of the problems we face are, what some of the resources we have to really address these issues, and then what changes have we made and what changes do we need to continue to make. This is a very complex issue. When we uh, created the coalition back in 2006, it actually predated me coming here. It was a group of residents along with the selectmen and some key leaders in the town who got together in response to overdoses that happened in the early 2000s to say, listen, we need to do more than just talk about this issue. We can't be blaming one organization versus the other or point fingers, we need to work on this as a, a, a community-wide um, issue, and that really is what started the coalition. And together they were able to secure some funding, and that was what allowed me and Julianne to, to be part of things and really develop the coalition a little bit. Yep. I just wanted to give a shout-out to Pat Spatini and Pete because they were key people who I just wanted to recognize Pat Spatini and, and Pete Heckenbleckner because it was their collaboration, their leadership, and their focus on Pat always sent the kiddos. Yes. But uh, at that time, that um, 
led to the formation of the bylaw that started this? And one of the things that both uh, Pat Scatini and Peter Hecknebleger talked a lot about is this should be a community coalition and not just a program of the town or the schools. It really needs to be something that everyone should be part of, including our business partners. So we're really so excited to have you part of this discussion and, and know for all of you that, that we're a resource for you. Um, we focus a lot of our work on our younger kids, our teenagers, but we're here as a resource for you as well. And we know that your employees can be impacted, um, friends and family members of your employees can be impacted. So we want to make sure that you know that we're here as a resource for you. Um, Elaine Webb, who some of you met in the beginning, she's our vice president of our board. We have a fabulous board of directors, um, 24 members that meet on a monthly basis. And we're always um, looking for new supporters of that. So if you're ever interested in getting more involved, we can share more information about that. How am I doing on, uh, can you hear me okay? Okay, great. So a little bit about kind of what our focus is. So we have um, two major goals. Our goal is really to strengthen collaboration in the community around the issue of substance abuse, and then also to reduce the issue, reduce substance abuse, particularly amongst young people, but also amongst our entire community. We know that adults are impacted. We know that grandparents are impacted. Um, so this is an issue that really affects all um, people across the lifespan. Um, our vision really is for us to really look at what resources we do have and use those to our, the best of our ability. We know there's never going to be enough money to do all the amazing things that we want to do, but really it's not so much about money, it's about getting people all moving in one direction around this really important issue. And a lot of it is around asking the tough questions of ourselves. We can't change as a community unless we look in the mirror and we think about what do we do in our own families, what do we do in our own workplace, what do we do in our own <laughs> life on a day-to-day -day basis. That really does affect um, how we shape and look at this issue of substance abuse. So we focus on primary prevention, which is to prevent young people from using at all. We also look at trying to delay the onset of use. We know that um, the research around brain development says that young people now actually develop their brains until about 24 years old. We used to think you were pretty well cooked at about 17, 18. Now we know that there's a lot of work that's happening in the brain until about 24. So if we can delay use, that actually helps the brain develop in a healthier way. And we also know it reduces the likelihood of developing the disease of addiction. If young people um, use alcohol before the age of 15, they're four times more likely to become dependent on alcohol. So if we can delay that as long as possible, they're less likely to become addicted. We also want to intervene in any early use. We know young people are going to be curious. We know that they might experiment. And so we want to make sure that we intervene and figure out why are they using, what's drawing them to it, what might be else going on in their life. You know, we use substances, all of us, to change how we feel. Uh, we all have different choices around what substances or what behaviors we choose. But the main reason why we use something is to change how we feel. So a lot of the questions we're asking young people is, what are you trying to change? What's not working in your life? What are you trying to, what are you trying to move that, that we can maybe help with? We also work on secondary prevention, particularly through our Mystic Valley Public Health Coalition work, which focuses on reducing overdoses and also um, encouraging people to think about some of the consequences of um, heroin and opioid use. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Some of the projects that we've done, one of the first projects we got involved in uh, with our police officers was developing the first medication collection program in the region. We knew that young people were saying that they were getting their pills from their uh, parents' medicine cabinet. So that was one of the first projects we worked on was let's reduce the access to the substance that's causing some of the development of the disease of addiction. And when we established the program, we, in, we expected to collect some pills. We had no idea that, um, you know, now in 2017, we've, we've collected 2.64 tons of medication. It's an enormous amount of pills that, that come in, and that's just a fraction of what people have just in our small little community in Reading. We also um, have seen an increase in people bringing in stuff, so it takes time to break through. There's a lot happening in the community. It's hard to get the word out about programs that we have, but we know that over time, more and more people know about it. We encourage you to get rid of anything you don't need or want in your medicine cabinet, and also if you do have medications in the home, to keep them away from young people uh, for risk of child poisoning and also just access. We know that similar to diabetes or cancer, addiction is a really complex disease, and it requires kind of a multi-tiered system of treatment. Um, people get well in a lot of different ways, but they usually get well 
from a variety of methodologies. So meaning they may require some medical treatment, they may require a support system, they may require kind of changing some of the things in their social life. But it's not just one thing. And when it comes to prevention, it's the same thing. We have to do a lot of things, sometimes a lot of little things to kind of move the needle. We know that it's hard to get people to think about this issue. If I were to say to you, I want you to change the most negative thing in your life, you may be ready, you may not. And so there's a period of uh, thinking that goes on in terms of our readiness to make a change. It's really hard to look at our own behavior and go, yeah, there's a problem. I need to do something about it. And so that's that pre-contemplation stage that can happen with anyone who's looking to make some behavior change. The same thing happens in our community. When we first started talking about this issue of substance abuse, there was a lot of denial in Reading around us actually having a substance abuse problem. Um, in fact, we had people who said, why are you talking about it? It's going to give our town a bad reputation. And unfortunately, that kind of stifled some of the discussion. But what we've been able to get people to embrace is if we don't talk about it, we can't change it. So we do have to talk about it. We do have to embrace it. And there's a variety of steps that we take to kind of nurture that. So over the last uh, 11 years or so, we've reached about 15,000 people through a variety of different educational programs. Um, lots of great stuff. I'm not going to get into all that, but I just want you to know there's lots of great resources available. We also embarked on a huge mental health first aid project over the last two years after Sandy Hook happened. Um, we took a specific interest in looking at how could we intervene earlier to identify signs and symptoms of mental health. We were able to secure a federal grant and we trained 650 people in identifying the signs and symptoms in Reading. That program, um, we have trainers in Reading that are certified to train workplaces um, in adult mental health first aid. So if that's ever something that you're interested in, we can provide that for free to you. So if you were to think about a person who's addicted to their smartphone, how many people have a smartphone in here? <laughs> I have mine right here. I don't wear my watch anymore, so I use it for the timing. Um, <laughs> so if you were to think about a person addicted to their smartphone, they kind of all look like us, right? Um, they look like my kids who are 17 and 15 who, oh my god, their thing goes off all day long. Um, I've learned to take away the Wi-Fi password. I have blocks on their phone. I've tried every strategy you can imagine. I physically take them away. But it's hard, right, because you get used to using it for all kinds of different things. It's a computer in your pocket. If you were to think about someone who's addicted to nicotine, do you know anyone that's been addicted to nicotine? Yes. Yeah. Pretty common, right? And really hard to kick. <laughs> it's not an easy drug to get away from because it's part of your everyday life. It becomes just part of breathing almost. So it's a really hard one. When you think about someone that could be addicted to alcohol, anyone have that experience? I know in my own family, I you know lived with that. It's a very challenging thing. When you think about someone who's addicted to pills, anyone maybe have that experience. Lots of us may know someone who's addicted to heroin, but they're the same person that could be addicted to nicotine, that could be addicted to alcohol, that could be addicted to their smartphone. It's behavior. So when we think about who a heroin user is or someone that uses heroin, sometimes we depersonalize and we think of the other, the person that wouldn't be part of our family, that person that wouldn't work at our, our business. They're just like us. <laughs> They're struggling with the same issues. And so when we think about embracing this idea of support, we have to think about it could be your next door neighbor, it could be someone in your family, it could be your child. So we have to really get past the stigma piece. Um, that's one of the biggest blocks um, to getting people to ask for help. So we know that stigma is really one of the leading barriers, and that's a lot of um, the work that we've been doing, particularly with the Mystic Valley Public Health Coalition, is to get the word out about getting people to talk about this issue. Um, when you are a parent, if your child breaks their leg, kids you know, see them with the cast, often moms will say, oh yeah, I had to take them to the hospital, we had to get the x-ray, blah, blah, blah. If your child comes home and has been drinking, there's less conversation about that. Right? We don't talk about, oh, they slipped up and they, they were at a party. Why don't we talk about that? You know, It's something that we could share as parents and say, I, I don't know what to do. I'm overwhelmed. I'm pissed. I, you know, I don't know what to say. Or this is how I handled it. Do you have any ideas? Just like we ask people for recommendations about the best orthopedist. But we don't. We, there's still that stigma there around talking about it. And that's something that we really got to push through. Because if we don't talk about it when they're young, we're not going to talk about it as they get older. And the problem only gets worse. 
We know that heroin use is part of a much larger substance abuse problem. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. I've never met anyone that just picked up a needle, just started with heroin. It doesn't start that way. You know, it's a much slower progression. Uh, we definitely have people who start with pills and then make that transition to heroin. But there's usually some burgeoning behavioral issue that's happening, and sometimes a co-occurring mental health issue that could be happening that leads to that development of an opioid disorder. We know that opioid-related deaths uh, in Massachusetts have, are much higher than they were in 2000. Um, in Reading, um, we've lost 80 people to opioid-related deaths um, since 2000. So that's 80 people in our community um, that are no longer here that friends and family have lost. Um, and I know uh, our funeral home has you know, been at the forefront of, of comforting and working with those families. And it's, it's very challenging when you meet and talk with families because this is their loved one. You may think of it as a, a picture of who a heroin user is or who someone is addicted looks like, but they're beautiful people. They're beautiful kids. They're people that you would see on the street and you know, talk to. There's, there's no other in all of this. So it's important to kind of get that idea out of your head if you can. We know that there's a huge impact on others. Um, we know that parents of people who are struggling with opioid disorders, they're not sure what to do. They're not sure if they should help the person, kick them out. They don't know what to do. Julianne, our alcohol and drug counselor, spends a lot of time on the phone with parents, uh, encouraging them to get their own support because it's very stressful to live with parenting through a substance use disorder, whether themselves they're struggling or their loved one. We also know that friends and colleagues can be impacted. Um, there's a lot of behavior that goes on that's very negative when someone's using a substance. We also know that for the people that have died, we now have children being raised by grandparents. In Reading um, and Stoneham and Winchester, Wakefield, Melrose, um, there are now two support groups for grandparents raising their grandchildren because of opioid deaths. So it's, it's definitely happening and they're starting over in a way that they never imagined they would be starting over. We've ha heard from, uh, particularly in Stoneham, a few families that were retired out in Florida and other parts of the, the country and who've now come back to their community to raise their grandchildren because of these deaths. So they really thought they were at a different phase in their life and kind of starting over again. Not easy. We also have seen a huge increase in substance exposed newborns, so moms using while pregnant. Um, Melrose actually, Melrose Wakefield delivers the third largest amount of uh, neonatal exposed newborns, so um, babies born with opioids in their system. They actually have a specialty in that area in terms of caring for moms. They've developed some really great resources. Um, there's a wraparound program now for moms and babies until age five. So they've had a lot of success with getting moms clean, keeping them well, providing support. But imagine the amount of fallout that comes with having a baby exposed and being unable to parent if they're unable to get well. So a lot of challenges there. In terms of Reading, um, our local police are quite busy. <laughs> um, in, let's see, it's about nine months since January uh, of 2017, we've had 20 overdoses that our local police have responded to um, and our Reading Fire Department have helped with by administering Narcan. Um, an additional 120 overdoses were handled by police in five nearby communities. So this is something happening day in, day out. We also know that our officers are handling a lot of other issues that are connected to this, um, this issue of substance abuse. We had 37 suicide attempts. Now we're just talking since January 1st to now. 37 suicide attempts, 99 drug-involved encounters, 126 mental health issues that they needed help with. 147 alcohol-involved incidents, and 315 motor vehicle crashes investigated. So that's just a little snapshot of our little community. And I'm sure North Reading is probably pretty, pretty similar, and Winchester probably not, not too far behind in terms of a lot of the same challenges. Sometimes folks think Reading's small community, you know, what are, what are our police doing? Well, very, very busy, <laughs> very busy. Our officers were trained in mental health first aid um, over the summer and have been um, doing a great job of connecting folks to services, encouraging um, local folks to take advantage of our emergency uh, crisis response program that's in our region, and really um, just having a little bit more empathy and um, guidance around helping um, more of these complex mental health challenges. We know that prevention is on a continuum. So we're working as a prevention coalition on one little area 
There's also a whole treatment and recovery movement that's happening and part of recovery month is us kind of trying to bring attention to that, that recovery works, people can get in recovery, they can stay well. Uh, the research shows that people can recover from substance use disorders at about the same rate as, as managing hypertension and diabetes. So there may be bumps, there may be challenges, but they can stay well. Requires a lot of support and treatment, but it can happen. Some of the workplace issues that we wanted to kind of bring out was this issue of stigma. We wanted to give you a little bit of guidance around policy issues. Um, Lauren did a great job of working with this uh, fabulous firm in Boston. You guys um, may have seen the packet. Um, we can get you copies. Um, that gives you um, sample policies, sample ideas around whether you're a very small employer or a much bigger employer, what, what you can do within your workplace to kind of help this issue. Um, we also recognize that not every business would have an employee wellness program or an employee assistance program. Um, I grew up in a family um, where we own a small business and there's three employees, so I know what it's like to not have those extra services. And one of the resources that our coalition, um, our regional group and our local group have brought is some resources that you can use whether or not you have one of those programs or not. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Narcan and restroom safety just to make sure that you're keeping your employees safe. Any questions so far? Doing okay? Feel free to get up and get more food. You don't have to just stay put. <laughs> uh, so some of the um, sample things to think about, and many of you probably have a lot of these in place, but it's important to kind of rethink them a little bit. Um, do you have a substance abuse policy for your employees? If they drive vehicles that you own, do you have a policy around testing for drivers? Um, do you have training for your supervisors? Do they know how to react if someone comes to them with an issue, whether it's for them personally or a friend or a family member? Um, if you don't have an employee assistance program, what are the resources that you can use from our coalition that might be helpful? I'll talk a little bit about those. And then just employee education. Can you offer or sponsor some education where maybe we could come in or our partners could come in and, and give your employees a little bit of support? Um, some of the major policies um, are in the packet that we have for you, um, and there's also a great drug-free workplace kit where you can just download sample policies and kind of fill in the blank a little bit. It's pretty easy, pretty straightforward. We're happy to get you more resources on that. We also, um, in lieu of having an employee assistance program, we actually pay for a resource for all Reading residents or people that work in Reading to use what's called the Interface Referral Service. It's kind of a matchmaking service for mental health. If you have someone or an employee who's looking for mental health services, instead of just calling a random number or um, looking at a list of resources, you can call, tell them what your problem is, and they will um, do some research, find out who's available in your area, who takes your insurance, and who has available appointments in the next two weeks. When it comes to finding mental health services, sometimes you can wait eight weeks for an appointment, and um, the Interface Referral Service kind of shortens that time frame and makes it easier for you. So that's free for all of you to, to think about using. We've had the Interface Referral Service since November of 2016. We've had 60 uh, families use the service for a variety of different issues, ranging from uh, grief and loss to anxiety, depression, uh, substance abuse, parent issues, divorce. So it can be any variety of issues that would come up um, for many employees. Um, in terms of naloxone, how many folks have heard of Narcan or naloxone? You may have seen on the news, right? So this is this amazing drug that can actually reverse the impact of an overdose. Um, our first responders, our Reading Fire Department has carried it um, since the late 90s, and they've saved hundreds of lives with this amazing um, drug. What we've seen change with the ability to use Narcan is um, with heroin, it used to take one dose of Narcan to bring a person back to kind of restart the respiratory system. What we see now with fentanyl-laced heroin or just fentanyl, which is what a lot of people are ingesting, it's much more powerful, so it can take three, four doses of Narcan to bring a person back, and not always can they bring someone back. So just know that Narcan can be helpful, but it isn't always enough. Um, what Narcan does is kind of pop um, the drug off the receptors, but it's short acting, so it only lasts for about 30 or 90 minutes. It puts a person into immediate withdrawal, which is very uncomfortable. And so sometimes people will say, okay, so you saved their life, but they, they're going to go into treatment, right? They're going to they're gonna get better. Well, sometimes they're really pissed off <laughs> and really uncomfortable, physically uncomfortable. So it's really hard to talk to someone at that very moment about, what do you think about treatment? because they're feeling physically not well. 
So it's a process of kind of getting someone ready, and there's a lot of support that we're trying to get people to implement at the emergency room level, uh, officers handing out resources, as well as in our local community, because it may not happen at the time of the overdose, it may happen as a follow-up. Um, different police departments are doing kind of follow-ups after the fact. I'm not sure if Winchester has implemented that yet, but sometimes they'll reach out a couple days after and kind of check in. Um, but there's no magic answer. A lot of it is try trying to help people get to that point where they might be ready. Um, we know for an overdose, really important to call 911, even if you administer Narcan or you know someone has administered Narcan, it is short acting and they may require another dose. Putting someone in the recovery pos position is really important. If you know how to do rescue breathing, that's very helpful. And then also if you have Narcan to, to administer it. To access Narcan, um, you can go to any local pharmacy and um, let them know you'd like to buy it. You can buy it um, from the pharmacist. Um, they do charge usually a small copay for it. Um, we've checked with our local pharmacist. They all have it available. If you have any trouble, let us know. There is an app, app that we have linked on our website where you can look for your nearest pharmacy. Um, but that's something that we encourage um, if you have um, any concerns to have Narcan on site. All of our public schools now have Narcan in the building. Um, our firefighters always have it, um, but in terms of wider access, it's not necessarily something that all workplaces have. You may have EpiPens, you may have something else like that, but you may want to think about Narcan. In terms of restroom safety, and as I go through this, Lauren, it helped me if I'm missing anything. So we know that if you have a public restroom, it's something to think about in terms of safety for you and your employees. We've had many overdoses happen in Reading and public restrooms. Um, so it's important to think about a couple things. If you come upon an overdose, you want to make sure that you call 911 right away. If you have Narcan, administer it, but you also want to think about your own safety. There could be needles. Um, there could be needles in the trash. Um, so really important to think about using universal or standard precautions, which if you haven't been trained in a health organization, you may not even know about this stuff. But one basic thing is not to push down on trash, because if there's a needle in the trash, you can get stuck. Um, other things to think about is if there's any hazardous materials. We know that fentanyl, actually you can touch fentanyl and get um, sick from touching it. Um, there's different types, and not all of them will make you sick, but important to just let the officers and first responders handle out the materials. Even things that look like tissues or um, things that might be wrapped, you don't know what's inside it, so just leave things <laughs> as is. Um, and then I know that um, we have some materials for you that talk about tips for a safer bathroom. We encourage you to take those with you and think about it. And then also um, what you can do to recognize an overdose. And these are things you could put in your employee areas or have in your bathrooms. Any questions on restroom safety? Lauren, did I miss anything? Uh, I have a simple question. Yeah. Okay. Great. Officers, do you want to help me? Because you've 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 been there. Some things I'm going to jump out because nobody else. A lot of times with overdosing, you don't see the needle in the arm. You don't see the um, the tourniquet or the rope band they use around their arm, so on. Unless the people come across mm -hmm. with the needle still in, or something on the ground. There's usually something that jumps out at you that this drug use. Uh, that piece of puff bag, some powdered residue, uh, the spoon that used to put stuff up, depending on what they're using. Absolutely, just blue, blue in color, sometimes gray, blue, uh, and uh, that recovery position is a great place to put them in. And just don't, and tell your employees not to touch anything. Very important. There's something called agile breathing, it's like, it's like, um, it's like a gurgling, it's like a, it's a desperate gas, last gas before they stop breathing. So an agile breathing, it's like a gurgling, with some white, um, white brown coming out of the mouth, look for that kind of stuff. Careful though. Yeah. 
legal issue with me administering it? Is there a wrong way to do it? Is there, if you administer it to someone who's not having an overdose, but it's, and I, I'm just nervous. To yeah, think about that's a really good question. Jumping in and doing yep. it and be like, oh, well, I wasn't, had, I was an epileptic seizure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We had, we had taught Narcan at the our ambulance service. If the person's not having an overdose, Narcan will hurt them. Okay, if, yeah. If there's no negative effect to doing it, um, there's an effect we don't use it, so you can't get in trouble for using it long back in good faith. And um, again, there's no negative effect giving to somebody that we're overdose. Okay. So it's kind of covered under that Good Samaritan law if you're acting, you know, in the best interest and you think that, you know, you're, but you want to make sure that when you call 9-1, you let them know what you've done so that when they arrive, they know that there's already one dose on board. Um, sometimes because Narcan is either administered um, through the nose, it's kind of intranasally, you kind of squirt up the substance, kind of like an Afrin type of thing, or um, there's a uh, pre-injected one. Um, that's also useful. Um, sometimes some of it falls out so you don't get the whole dose in. Um, and that's why it's important for first responders to know it may or may not have gone in. So if, if you just kind of, it kind of came, came out and didn't get in, you just want to let them know this, I tried this and this is where we are. Um, and they'll take it from there, but they're very skilled. Um, I think at this point our Reading firefighters have administered probably over 500 doses of Narcan on average in the last three, three or four years. So I mean, they're very skilled at this. They know what to look for, they know what to do. And the response time is very fast in our community as well as I know North Reading also um, has access as well. Once it's administered, how long does it take until they come It's pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty quick. I don't know if you guys want to, I mean, you've, it's, you've seen it's it happen. Basically, if they're overdose and it's okay, they come out of it like that, it's basically, and they wake up usually aggressive from what we've seen. Um, it basically takes the high immediately away from them. There's a picture of you where I was having a few drinks, you're feeling good, and then immediately somebody gave you something and you went to the handling stage. That's kind of how it's described to me. It's pretty instantaneous when it happens. And again, it depends on how strong the drug was, the fentanyl, then laced with it, how many doses they get, but it's usually pretty quick. But again, it's only a temporary fix. So it usually lasts, I think, max of about 90 minutes, and then they could re overdose. That's why it's important to kind of get them um one thing to think about is a lot of people will say okay well what happens after say 911 gets involved and do they go to the hospital can someone walk away like what happens next there was a law passed last year to help first responders with getting people into the ambulance because they're adults they could refuse care but there is a new law in place that allows officers to actually kind of put someone in you know, kind of protective custody to get them into the ambulance. However, when they get to the hospital, they can choose to leave. So it's still their choice as an adult. That's why you may hear about families who are struggling to get their loved one into treatment. Um, they may have to resort to filing a court order to get their loved one into treatment. Um, that's a really hard process, but it's definitely a resource that we have and we can talk people through it. Our officers are all trained on what a Section 35 is, what, how you go about it um, at the court. Um, but it is one of those things that um, it's very difficult to force someone into treatment if um, they have kind of all their faculties in place. Um, so it's, it's just something to kind of keep in mind. Okay. Yes? I think that's um, sort of a newer aspect of the stigma is around the Narcan. Because the yes. people who don't know think, why the heck are we doing this? Because then they're just overdosing again and we're using all our resources of our police department. And you know, and we're, what are we doing? Are we wasting our time? Because I don't think you know, people don't understand that process. So that's yeah. great to hear that at least there's a way to get them into the ambulance um, yes. legally. But that, that's so, you might get people on board to some extent to get rid of the stigma, okay, we should use the Narcan, and then it's, then you've got this other piece of it that I know. Right. And I don't know. And I, and I totally get that. You know, I've had conversations with my own family about, you know, why, why do we keep reviving people who don't want to get well? Yeah. And, and what I say is if it was my kid, I'd want someone to hit him with Narcan because it's yeah. my kid. It's my kid. You know what I mean? And so if it's your kid, do you really care if they've overdosed four other times and they're not ready for treatment? It's your kid. You know what I mean? So this is someone's kid. Do you want them lying on the side of the street or do you want to get them better? And we can't treat a dead addict. So if, if we can get them breathing again, then we have a chance of getting them well. Is it frustrating? Man, is it frustrating, particularly when you see all the consequences around a person. They've ruin pretty much everything in their life with their disease, but at the same time, they just may not be ready. But when you see people in recovery, you begin to believe in the process and you know it's worth it if you can kind of just keep the faith a little bit. Um, I know particularly for first responders, it's really hard because they can see some of the same people over and over again. 
and sometimes they don't see them go off to treatment and come back in a year and, and looking well. Um, they tend to see the worst part of substance abuse. Um, but at the same time, you have to think about those family members who love that person. I, I, I think it, it's frustrating. It's resource intensive too. Yeah. And the, the, the ROI, what, what's, what's the ROI that you can fit into your town budget? It's not there. The ROI is my child is alive and I have another chance. Yes to work with them and help them and hope that they get the care and that this time their recovery is the, the last time. Right. Like where they can stay in recovery um, right. um, and not fall back. So I think, you know, that's really hard. We have a like, very significant financial crisis in this town and this is very resource intensive. It is. It requires a lot of resources, and it also can be very difficult to get people thinking on the idea of prevention because there's no immediate um, Respond, no immediate return. You know, we've been doing this for 11 years and we've seen our rates for underage drinking go down by 12%. But that was 1% at a time, year to year. <laughs> you know, and we kept saying, you got to just stick with us, we're going to get there. You know, but that's 12% less kids who were exposed to alcohol poisoning. That's 12% less kids that may develop the disease of addiction. That matters in, you know, in our community, but it takes time, it takes that investment o over time. Absolutely. So it, the stigma happens, I think, more so when it's adults. Yes. You know, I don't know that any of us are looking at a child or a 16 year old or you know, anyone under the age of maybe 25. So I, I don't know how to. I certainly have preconceived notions. Right. And, I'm, and the, I'm married to a first responder, and and I all and I and I consider what resources are available to help them. Yes. You know what I mean, I. Absolutely. I don't know. I, yeah. I, it, it's really frustrating. This yeah. whole thing is, I, I have a sick feeling in my stomach. This whole presentation is going to ask me. It's really hard. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just open my minds to this and, and how to treat it, especially when I, you know, my line of work, a lot of people who work with anxiety have depression and yes. suffer from anxiety yeah. and isolation. And that. So this is all really important that we're here. I just, I don't know. I, I guess I have a lot of questions on how to sort of. Yeah, and it's, it's okay to grapple with all that. It, it brings up a lot of issues for all of us. And, and those concerns about our first responders are all really valid. I mean, they're, they're using a lot of resources. They're also witnessing a lot of trauma. Um, there's a lot <laughs> happening. And we do provide the best training that we, c we can access. It's partly why I write grants so much is <laughs> because we never will have enough local resources, but we're trying to pull in resources where we can from federal and state resources and also private foundations because we, we do need the training, we need the support. Um, one example is having our mental health first aid training for our officers really important because it touched not just on what do you do to help someone who has a mental health crisis, but what about how you're feeling about this? What about if someone approaches you? What about if someone makes you uncomfortable? All of those kinds of things because they're dealing with it all day, day in and day out. When we think about adults and substance use, yes, they're adults, they can make their own decisions. Um, we may or may not choose to allocate resources to that, but also at the end of the day, they're a more productive member of society if they're well. So we also wanna think about those are potential employees, those are potential family members, those are people that, um, thanks Lauren for coming, um, those are they're people that really could be an important part of our community. Um, one of our board members runs a sober living home um, in Wakefield, just across um, the lake there, um, and they have about you know 10 or 12 young men at, the t at a time living in and sober living and it's amazing to see their process of recovery and, and how powerful they can be as community members when they're well um, but it takes a lot of resources um, to get them to that that stage but when they do get there they want to give back and they want to put back in what they've taken and so I do see a lot of that kind of circle happening I guess seeing some We can talk about it, and you know, that's one of the things, you know, you, you see a lot about overdose, you see less about recovery, and that's the whole point of Recovery Month, is to get people thinking about, a lot of people live anonymously in recovery for the reason of stigma, because they're worried about judgment. Um, we are having an event next Tuesday to celebrate recovery, um, and also to remember those that we've lost. Um, we have people in all walks of life who are living in recovery, but them choosing to share their story is personal, and so that's why you hear less. Um, we definitely will have people speaking about their own recovery at our, our event next Tuesday, but at the same time, you also have to respect people's um, rights to privacy. Um, so it's, it's this kind of balancing act, right?
The vigil. Yes, the vigil, yep. So I know I'm not answering all your questions, but the questions that are coming up for you are all very typical. You know what I mean? That they're all important. And we're all struggling with a lot of the same questions. Um, we talked a little bit about, you know, kind of what you can do to recognize an overdose. Um, what our police ask is if you're concerned about something in your workplace, um, if you're concerned about someone's behavior, um, and anything like that, you know, report the activity. Don't wait. It's really important to get in front of it. Call 911 if it's needed. That's what they're there for. Um, believe me, we get calls on some of the smallest <laughs> little tiny things to have you call for something around this issue. Really, they welcome those calls. Um, we also have a text-to-tip program, so maybe you don't want to share who you are, but you want to communicate with our officers anonymously. That's what our text-to-tip program is for, and we sponsor that so that people can feel okay about sharing something about a neighbor or sharing something about a colleague that maybe they don't want to share um, by acknowledging who they are. So with that, I just want to kind of open it up to questions. Thanks, right. Elaine. Thank Appreciate it. I'll open it up to questions and, and have a little chat. Yes. Like? So hours? it's an eight hour training. It is approved by the um, National Professional for Human Resources, so it counts as one of your con kind of continuing ed uh, resources. Um, there's uh, a couple different programs. There's mental health first aid for adults that want to support other adults, and then there's a youth mental health first aid program that's um, geared to people who might have children in their life or teens in their life, so parents often appreciate the youth program. Um, but we run both programs, and that's something we can provide. A lot of places can't do eight hours at a time, so we'll come one hour at a time, two hours at a time, whatever you can kind of. So you would come into a workplace? Yep, we would come into a workplace. If you have five people that you can train at a time, we'll come in. So if maybe you don't have enough people, we could partner with other businesses and kind of pull a group together. Would yeah. you for your whole team or if you could handyman or owners? Um, we recommend anybody because it's anyone who has contact okay. at all. Because often the person who runs the front desk is, or the person who answers the calls gets the most stress, <laughs> you know, because they handle a lot of the brunt of the, the community, uh, the customer service stuff. Um, and people forget about that. They think about the supervisor, which is important, but also it's really anybody who is working with the public or has a role in the, in the business or the company. Yeah. Other thoughts? Questions? Lisa? I'm just I'm absorbing so much about I guess even after we talked, you don't realize until you see the numbers. Like, I think I'm just struggling with, like, wow, you never realize how much it's people you know and see every day. Um, I think it's really important, and it's a hard topic to talk about, but that's right. So I guess I don't have a question for because I'm digesting. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, like, close I close didn't need to put you on the spot, but, I, you know, I could see you kind of processing, so I was just... Yeah, no, I yeah. think it's... Uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad we're talking about it. Definitely best in mental health first aid. Thing yes, we're, we're all kind of interested in that yeah. here. Um, is it is it something really for like employees to notice other employees, or it's, would it be helpful like we're from a bank? Like, would it yeah. be helpful for people to identify customers? Both. But my question is, yeah. what like if there's a if you notice that a customer is having a mental health issue, yeah. how, how does a like how does a workplace yeah. a business help that person without putting right. them in, I mean, jeopardizing so your it, it's you know? a It's a lot of kind of reinforcing some of the basic customer service principles, but also how do you delicately notice something and maybe get help if you need it. Um, and also having resources available in your workplace um, for the community where people could, could know about something like Interface, um, where they could get support. Uh, but it also helps the employee kind of if they have it on, um, uncomfortable encounter, you know, say someone comes in very heavy anxiety, um, that can also upset the person working behind the counter too because there's there can be some sometimes some anger or, you know, misdirected aggression that can happen and the mental health first aid helps the person deal with, okay, this is what may be going on with them and that's why they're behaving in that way and so it's you don't have to take it personal because it's really hard to kind of bounce back from some of those and then also how to de-escalate people who might be escalating. Um, which can happen in any environment. <laughs> um, so the strategies are really helpful for people to notice anything in themselves, their colleagues, also who they may encounter in the workplace, and then friends and family. So it's really kind of more of a universal. It's really the same idea as regular first aid, but for mental health issues. So when you think about regular first aid, how many people have been trained in regular first aid? Okay. Have you ever had to use your training 
ever have to resuscitate someone? Okay, maybe Band-Aid or basic first aid, that kind of stuff. It's very rare that you as a lay person will have to respond to a major crisis, but it's good to have a little bit of those skills because it helps you go through the steps that you need to do to get that higher level of service if you need it. Um, our first responders are used to dealing with it all the time, but we're not, as the average people, placed in those high stress situations. So the mental health first aid kind of helps you manage some of that and kind of practice some scenarios that are non-crisis as well as crisis. So you can feel a little bit more prepared, a little bit more skilled. Um, I want to go over some of the resources we have for you. Um, I'm just going to grab one of the bags here. So we have a great resource list, which uh, explains all of our local substance abuse resources, as well as the interface program that I talked about is on the back. We have a mental health resource list, as well as Interface on the back. What I say is if you don't want to make a lot of calls, just call Interface, it's one phone call. Um, what else do we have in here, Julie? We have our brochure on the coalition. Um, and then also some great resources that you can have for employees or customers, our Interface card. So Interface is operated by William James College. They're the Mass School of Professional Psychology. So the people who answer the phone are licensed clinicians. So rather than calling a, maybe a doctor's practice where you may get a receptionist answer, when you call Interface, you're getting a licensed clinician right off the bat. So they ask, they know what questions to ask. They know how to kind of get someone thinking about getting into some mental health care. It's very difficult because of the stigma to want to go see a, a clinician. So mental health first aid and the Interface referral service kind of helps break down those barriers. We have a pocket resource guide. Also, it has the recovery information on the back for Narcan and information about how you access naloxone or Narcan. And then a little bit more on um, reducing stigma in our state. So those are just some of the basic resources. On our website, we have tons more. And wherever your businesses are located, there's likely a coalition um, like Winchester, like ourselves, that also has even more resources as well. Can I answer any questions? Dr. Pody. Oh, Dr. Pody. So we have a speaker, um, so we have two events next week. On Tuesday the 26th, we're doing a candlelight vigil and rally for recovery at the high school at 6 p.m. Um, all, everyone is welcome. If you wanna come hear some stories of recovery, great opportunity. And then we have Dr. Pody coming, who is a um, nationally recognized family physician and addiction medicine specialist who's gonna be speaking at the high school from seven to nine. Really encourage people who have children to come to that. She's really great um, for, for families um, to think about it. So those are some of the events that we have. And I think we are almost done. So I will wrap up and happy to answer any individual questions. Uh, I have one question for Mrs. Harvin. I know this summer at the high school. Do you cover all the schools? I cover all the schools, but I'm based out of high school. And you're there just to send the resources for teachers. Yeah, but actually, that's what the ASO of the schools are going to be smarter than the students. They still, they still have certain things. Yeah, I'm a, I've been in town for many years, and my children have been in schools since they were in New York. Senator Bobby was actually the very first school resource officer that had. It's what you should not use a part of the same Yeah, my kids are in the system, but I think it's a resource. It's not as easy to do that. I have a friend that's in the back, so I've heard about it, but I didn't realize it was not mine. I think that's something that the town should promote and let people know that that's happening. It's a scheme for that. That's part of, you know, the numbers are overwhelming. It's surprising to me. You know, I feel like I'm more than know than not, but I'm not the uh, so I probably could. Thank you so much. I'm happy to answer any individual questions. Julianne and I are just a phone call away. If you ever come across an employee, you have a question, and you're just like, I don't even know how to approach this, give us a call. We're happy to kind of talk things through with you. Julianne is great at troubleshooting. Um, and just know that we're a resource for you, and, and we're free to you. That's why we write for these grants, and we try to get the resources we can so that we can be available to you. So thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.